Hello everyone, welcome to MDBGS weekly show, The H Panel. Uh, the H Panel will be talking about today current state of Ethiopia that will give us uh, an area to cover in terms of domestic and foreign affairs. I'm joined uh, by Faisal Robla, Takla Gaurav Mikael, and Skel Gabisa today. And we'll start with the first segment, what stood out for each of the panelists. Let's start with Faisal. Faisal, what stood out for you over the past seven days? Yeah, I think uh, one that stood out for me, and I'll be very brief to probably interrelated. One is the uh, the El Nino effects in the Horn of Africa, particularly in the Somali region, where people have been really negatively damaged and hurt by that uh, by rivers that have broken the banks, and at up to this point, uh, the Ethiopian federal government uh, did not prioritize, didn't speak about it as much as anybody would want. Uh, I haven't seen anything written by the federal government. It, it looks like the government completely ignored or didn't prioritize because of the other war situation is that the country is uh, reeling from. Neither did the local government uh, really did any major uh, uh, work. So people have died. Uh, livestock has been lost and I think uh, crops have been already destroyed. That's one. So the second, uh, and I shared with you, but probably we can do this, that some other time. I did some research as to, you know, the environmental impact degradation taking place in the Horn of Africa by just looking at the carbon footprint of several countries from the United States to Qatar to Dubai to our situation. So you're right here. And basically Qatar, uh, as small as it is, and close to Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa, has one of the largest carbon footprints. So is United Arab Emirates and the Saudi, whereas countries like Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, Sudan, are almost close to even zero, their carbon footprint. But in the meantime, they are suffering from the environmental crisis and the linear situations that we have. So I think, you know, one of these days, there would be some sort of accountability of who is doing what and who has been impacted. But both Somalia and Ethiopia are very negatively impacted. The second issue that really stood out for me, and this is also very brief, was the uh, Somalia's uh, assigning of its first ever ambassador to Eritrea, Idris, uh, 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 Omar Idris uh, has been assigned. President Isai Safwork received his paperwork, very well received. What makes this important for me is that Omar Idris is a very close associate of President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed in many ways, in politics, in familiar relationship, in the level of confidence that Hassan Sheikh Mohammed has uh, in him. So it tells me uh, that the relationship between Eritrea and Somalia is really very much warming, not to mention the troops that Eritrea has trained for Somalia and the fact that they are working closely on the issues that are facing the two, the two, the two uh, regions. I think uh, somebody who just visited President Isaiah Safor shared with some of our friends uh, that the relationship between Isaiah's and uh, Prime Minister Abi is very bad. This person is somebody who has had relationship both with President Isaias and Prime Minister Abi when they were all together, that whole Somalia slash Eritrea and Ethiopia integration. He was one of the guys who was just in between kind of guy. And now he just returned from Asmara and he tells uh, some friends that the relationship is almost zero. You can say it's not only zero, but also worse. So we will be watching how this work goes, but I think uh, Idris's assignment tells me a lot between, in terms of the relationship between Isaias and, and Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Faisal, for that uh, brief uh, uh, intro. Eskel, uh, what about you? What are the highlights for the week? There are many. Uh, a lot happened this week. Uh, in the Horn of Africa or in the Red Sea Basin, um, ranging from the economic difficulties of the country, as demonstrated by the Fitch uh, downgrade, 
put uh, pull out of ETO lease and uh, withdrawal of the African Development Bank from uh, from Ethiopia. Um, also, the, uh, the 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 blatant, the palpable uh, isolation of the Ethiopian Prime Minister in international fora. But I really like to speak to the, the issue that is uh, has not been reported on that much, but uh, one that I consider to be extremely important for uh, the future of uh, the region in, in general, and that is the the peace um, efforts uh, between the Ethiopian government and the Oromo Liberation Army in Dar es Salaam. It's been a long time. It's almost uh, more than 20 days since uh, they started contact and more than a week since uh, high level military um, officials had sat down in Dar es Salaam to try to find out uh, what, um, a peaceful settlement, uh, some kind of a way out from this conundrum of um, a win that is not winnable by, by both sides. And I think that's probably the reason that they decided to sit down and talk to each other. Now, if if any peace effort has to, uh, were to succeed, uh, if the government and the rebels are prepared uh, to cooperate, um, then they could reach a peace settlement. If the government and the, the rebels are not prepared to cooperate in solving problems, uh, the problems that led to the uh, conflict in the first place, the discontent uh, uh, in the region where the war is raging right now, the future is likely uh, uh, going to remain bleak uh, as was the case in the past. I think reconciliation uh, of conflicts uh, or conflicting uh, factions requires at least um, uh, uh, pre preparations and willingness uh, on the part of the negotiators, at least in, in, in several areas. But I just want to speak to some of them. Um, the, first, the, the first one is that the government must be genuinely determined and committed to end the conflict that has caused the civilian populations and the combatants to suffer atrocities of all kind. It did not help the government to consolidate itself uh, in, in, in the areas that are contested. So it's a political problem that requires political solution. So in that sense, reconciliation between the two is going to be extremely important. The government on its part could act promptly to demonstrate its willingness uh, to give the combatants a stake in governing the affected region after the peace settlement. This is extremely important. If they have a stake in it, if the rebels, the combatants have a, a stake in protecting their region, then there will be sufficient ground to reach reconciliation and peace. If that is not available, and that, that really bode, does not bode well for the negotiations. The second is the end of the fighting will not automatically guarantee the end of the lawlessness that the conflict had created. Ensuring internal peace uh, and all peace and order uh, and security uh, arrangements is going to be a matter of priority even after uh, an agreement had been signed. Um, Again, the government must enter into an agreement that includes that the rebels are involved in maintaining security in the area where they operate or they have been operating. If that is not done, just like it was done in the, the Pretoria Agreement, that some semblance of maintaining peace and security by Tigrayan of, uh, forces, if that was not there, the, the, the agreement would not have been reached. The same way, the same way, the government must not see these as uh, lawless people who are in the bush simply to, um, uh, to for uh, rambonisk uh, adventures. Then that will not be uh, that will not help uh, uh, to get to the to to the the problem that uh, actually led in the first place to the war. The third thing is the 
the conflicts reduce the long-term capacity of the area, the area of conflict to recover. So this negotiation must have uh, must have some kind of reconstruction plan, uh, recovery plan. In in the post-conflict environment of reconstruction, discrimination based on political beliefs and loyalty to the governing party's beliefs uh, must not be held against the, com the, the combatants right now. Uh, it should be a joint effort. To make peace should also be the, the joint effort as they were uh, a party to conflict. And finally, to achieve sustainable peace, it's important uh, that new institutions are created. Um, and in this new institutions of governance, both must also contribute to making peace. But if it is one side win all, if that's the approach, then peace cannot be uh, reached. On these matters, the two sides seem to be world apart, uh, as far as I'm concerned, or based on the information that I have. Well, this makes it doubtful that the, an agreement could be reached, but um, hope springs eternal. Now, having said that, this, having stated this, that the two sides must consider, consider uh, these areas, an important issue in peacemaking and peace implementation uh, is the threat of the hostile environment to peacemaking. Peacemaking always is surrounded by highly hostile environments to peace. Uh, in our case, there are several interest groups, particularly what I call spoilers, government officials who oppose peace, and conflict or war profiteers. All three are present uh, uh, in, in, in this case, and they're going to be uh, 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 obstacles to the implementation of any peace agreement that comes out. Unless both sides see that all of these, the spoilers, officials who do not want peace because they benefit from uh, continued uh, conflict for, for them politically, and conflict profiteers. For instance, there is a lot of uh, uh, gold gold uh, exchange uh, smuggling to, to Kenya and all the way to uh, UAE. These do not want the end of war, uh, the, end, the end of the conflict. So. The environment itself is really now complicated to make peace, but I hope that both sides understand that they're going to lose uh, and work diligently and, uh, and to, to, to reach an agreement. Um, uh, that's basically what I wanted to say, that it's a difficult environment, but uh, they can do it if they wanted to, to do and um, agree on these sets of uh, issues that I just raised. Great, uh, thank you, Skel, uh, for that, and uh, I'm sure we'll come back to that in the main topic as well. Uh, Tahlai, uh, again, uh, thank you for doing this at 1.25 a.m. Monday morning in uh, Sweden, uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, so what is the highlight for you over the past seven days? Oh, thank you, Getacho. I'm getting used to it now, so it's, it's all right. Um, what I think... I'd I um, um, I have uh, I have made it a habit now to to start by um, saying a few words about the condition of Tigrans in what they call IDP centers, but I prefer to call them concentration camps, uh, very very squalid concentration camps. And I would like to mention a report that was done by the BBC uh, three days ago in a in a concentration camp in in Shira. Um, and the word that the BBC used to describe the situation there is dire. The people there in the concentration camp are um, in extremely dire eco economic situation. They interview a woman who had her, who, who has her, um, her her son killed in the war by Eritrean forces, and she is now staying in the IDP center or in the concentration camp with her other children. And she doesn't have anything to, to, to eat. Um, they do receive some, some ration, but it's extremely limited. Um, it's, it's, it's hardly enough for, 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 for survival. And she's not an outlier. That is your average 
case, that is your average um, life condition in, in IP centers in, in Tigray. That uh, particular report is from Shura, but generally that is the condition that people in IDP centers are in, in, in Tigray. And this matters because the narrative that the Ethiopian government is trying to push is that everything has returned to normal. That IDP people who used to stay in IDP in Tigray have now returned to their um, homes to Western Tigray. That is the narrative that is being pushed. Um, and maybe Getacho will mention later um, Abi's speech at the, at the parliament, but that is one of the points that he made. He said that people have started to return to their homes. Well, actually he said that uh, the vast majority of people have already returned. And that is a categorical lie. And um, I think it was two days ago um, that the uh, the Secretary of State of the United States of America, Anthony Blinken, spoke to Abiy Ahmed on the phone about the implementation of the Pretoria Agreement. And from the readout from the U.S. government, um, the, the, the one of the points Anthony Blinken made is that the, the progress has been commendable the progress in terms of the implementation of the agreement, when in fact, not except for the what they call silencing the guns, nothing has been implemented. Western Tigray continues to be occupied by Eritrean and Amhara forces. Um, Europe uh, remains to be under the occupation of Eritrean forces. Um, Southern Tigray remains to be under the occupation of Amharas, and people are in the condition that I just described. But despite these very, very glaring factors, very, very ugly factors, we are being told to believe that everything has improved and um, everything is on, on the verge of being solved. And that is a lie. And honest people should um, understand that the suffering in Tigray continues. Um, nothing has changed for the, for the most uh, part. So that would be the, the first point. And I'm trying to emphasize the point because of the barrage of, 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 of lies that we are being told from the US State Department and from the Ethiopian um, regime. Um, and I think the other the other point that I should highlight, um, I had a lot of other points that I wanted to highlight, but um, um, Faisal and um, Eskel have done the job for me. So I, I will just um, mention one point, which is that the ICG, um, International Crisis Group, has issued a lengthy report um, and essentially an assessment of what is happening in Ethiopia. They give a background to the war in Amhara. They give a background to the war in Oromia. Um, they are like um, a scale hopeful that something could be a, uh, maybe forthcoming in, in Tanzania in terms of the negotiation um, that is happening between the OLA and the Ethiopian regime. Although um, I have been hearing from very, very reliable sources that it doesn't look like uh, there is anything promising. Um, I think they have some irreconcilable differences, the ATP regime and the OLA. Maybe, again, the scale will add uh, more information into that. But my understanding is that the OLA, one of the demands that the OLA has is that there should be a transitional government in Oromia. And the ATP regime seems to be completely against that. And that has got in the way. And it doesn't look like that there is there is going to be any agreement. But maybe um, they will listen to the powerful plea that the scale had just um, made. And um, the other point that I should um, mention now is that the fiasco um, involving the African Development Bank and the Ethiopian regime. And it was, it was, it was a joke um, what has happened. Um, so what happened was uh, that Ethiopia was um, due to pay um, the, the the bank is its annual source of contribution, and essentially the Ethiopian official is trying to scam the the, the bank, and the, the the bank was of, of course not to be taken for full, and some sort of um, disagreement ensued, and they tried the Ethiopian uh, regime officials tried to harass um, and actually beat up two officials from from the African Development Bank, and that is very very ironic. Because it's ironic because the president of the bank is a very, very close ally of Abiy Ahmed and also of Isaias Afurki, um, actually. And for his staffers in, um, in Addis Ababa to, to, to be harassed like, like that is extraordinary um, in that sense. And I think um, that is enough for, for now. Great. Uh, thank you, Tarlai. And um, the topic uh, we chose is the, both the domestic and foreign affairs the uh, two materials that 
uh, could be used for this is on November 13, the prime minister was in the parliament uh, to answer questions, a very lengthy uh, uh, session. Uh, of course, we know that uh, he received the questions two weeks ago and uh, get preparation and comes and he hears it again live and then uh, he answers. The other one is uh, he was in the Saudi Arabia, Saudi Africa summit uh, just last week. And that's also something that many people were discussing specifically within the context of what Faisal mentioned, Ethiopia Eritrea relationships, how the two leaders appear there and so on. So with that, uh, let's start with uh, uh, Faisal again. If you were to look at and choose the vital signs of the country, Ethiopia, uh, you can choose both perspective, domestic or foreign or one of them. Uh, how? What is your assessment? I think uh, diplomatically, Ethiopia is at a very, it's traveling in a narrow, narrow alley. Uh, from all indication is, it seems to have been isolated in the sense that it doesn't have the support or the alliance or the good relationship with Asmara, Mogadishu, Djibouti, and Khartoum and Cairo. These are really the core regions that we call the Horn of Africa and the extended Horn of Africa. And also some evidence to show us that Abi is at loggerheads with president, uh, uh, the president of Kenya uh, because of the things that he's saying. Uh, all these regions that I mentioned, probably with the exception of one or two, have legitimate concern against Abiy in the sense that Abiy became contemporary Horn of Africa's irredentist who carelessly, at least some irredentist is used to have cause celebre and a reason to, to, to put claim. But Abiy seems to be an uncontrollable irredentist that read his history in a very piece and pities and reaches out to the maximum to lay claim on other countries, either resources, ports, what have you. His current claim against the uh, Eritrea, if you will, Djibouti and Somalia, basically mirrors what both Menelik and Tedros did at the turn of the 19th century. Letter, famous letter that Menelik wrote to the Europeans and basically said, my country is far distant from your country. My road to the coast, to Zayla, to Jora, and Eden is at present closed by the Muslims. They prevent my receiving into my country armies and agricultural implements, artisanism, what have you and even messengers of the gospel. I cannot get the gospel into Ethiopia. Will you kindly raise your powerful voice in order that I may have this way open to me? As if that was not enough, Haile Selassie repeats the same language at the United Nations in the 1940s by again raising the issue of gospel and the Christianity of Ethiopia to qualify him to get access to the sea both Haile Selassie, Menelik, and even Tedros call the people who live Masowa, Zayla, and Somalia pagans when they are appealing to the Christian powers at the time. I think Abi is just putting the same thing to the table in a different way. This is the first time that somebody says, I have to have a port or access to the coast of the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean even though I know I don't own it, but I'm claiming because of A, B, C, D. I think in that case, he seems to be isolated. The one ally he has at this point in time is the Emir of Dubai. And history shows us that any country that Dubai and slash Abu Dhabi touched with its money has been destroyed from Syria to Libya to Yemen to Sudan and partly to Somalia. 
whether Ethiopia would be destroyed not by the nemesis that's creating, but by the very friend that it's keeping close to remains to be seen. In a nutshell, Ethiopian prime minister is isolated. He has been basically uh, seen with negative light by EU leaders as well as Washington. And the biggest reason why Washington is putting so much effort to even give a, a room to maneuver, although they know that what he's doing is against human rights, that he is taking the country into a negative course, is because of the fear, very legitimate fear, that if they push this man, Ethiopia can easily disintegrate and the entire Horn of Africa region can be destabilized. It is really a sort of like the devil that you have to deal with, both at the IGAD and Horn of Africa level, as well as at the international level. As if though that's not enough internally, and I will stop here, basically in every region of the country, people are starving from Tigray to the Amara region to Oromia. And as I started uh, my presentation with these in the Somali region, people are starving and dying. But Abi is paying big dollars that the country doesn't have to buy more weapons so that he can subjugate. So it looks like, at least with the report that the, the uh, uh, crisis group submitted, picks up from where the ICRI last report left. The ICRI report was having the lines of as a closure to say that they don't see any prospect of peaceful in Ethiopia even after Pretoria. And Takla really mentioned the only thing we inherited from the Pretoria Agreement is silencing the Gens. What we followed with after the Pretoria Agreement are more wars. The Oromo War has been intensified and the Amara War is raging very bad with drones being used against settlements. So I think he's isolated internationally. He's shunned off by local leaders in the region and the country internally, both economically, socially, and politically is in a disarray. He needs to come to the table for a big compromise with Tikrai, with the Oromo Ola group, and with the Amara. Without that, there's no progress that he can uh, look uh, in the future. Thank you, Faisal. Uh, scale on the, uh, you can add uh, on the big question of vital science and so on, but, uh, on the specific case of this negotiation that's happening, if you can call it negotiation, there is a, a concern that some people mention. Um, the government might not mean business uh, when even taking part in this because uh, had it not been for the war in Amhara and other you know, economic, all these challenges that you mentioned, uh, it wouldn't have even considered you know, being on the table. So. How serious is the government vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, what it did in Tigray and uh, what's happening in Amhara and so on, uh, scale? I mean, given the economic pressure uh, that I alluded to at the beginning, the diplomatic isolation, that is, that is visible. Uh, wherever he goes, people refuse to shake his hands, and his eyes are always on the, the Eritrean president, uh, mad at him or kind of begging him to, to talk to him, but that's not happening. In fact, what you see today is uh, uh, in the Horn of Africa scene, he seems to be the tallest guy than uh, the leader of Ethiopia, who is the leader of a bigger country, a bigger economy, bigger population, and has been historically the anchor state in uh, the Horn of Africa. Uh, with regard to, so given these pressures uh, and the military losses uh, uh, in the war against Tigray, in the war against the Romo and Aromia, or, or Romo Liberation Army, and now in um, the Amhara region, uh, it's not going to be easy. No? For five years, the European military had been at it everywhere, from Sidama uh, to Walaita to uh, Benishangul Gumus, and then to the bigger ones uh, with big, bigger populations in 
Oromia, Tigray, and, and Amhara. I think the Ethiopian, part, uh, the Ethiopian military is uh, basically tired, eviscerated. It's not really a serious fighting force at this point in time because uh, the, the soldiers are new recruits who are not properly trained and they don't have any reason to continue to fight. So if um, a military force doesn't have a reason for fighting, there will be no morale uh, that, that uh, um, encourages people to, to be an effective fighting force. But the whole country is tired. If the country is not supporting the war effort that the government is engaged in, it's just a matter of time before you lose. So given all of this, given all of this uh, economic and, and military and diplomatic pressure, you would think that the Ethiopian government would be now uh, uh, disposed towards choosing peace over continued war. But like I just said in my, my earlier remark, the position, the gulf between the two is enormous. I hoped uh, uh, that when they sent military personnel, the head of the intelligence uh, directorate in the Ministry of uh, Defense, uh, I thought that they were really doing something uh, that would end the conflict, uh, at least end the, uh, the fighting. But what I'm hearing right now is, is, um, is probably, I don't know if it's disinformation or so, uh, that uh, the, gulf is between, the gulf between the two positions is is so wide that it cannot be bridged and on this one it's it's on the government uh, as far as i'm concerned it's on the government they can de simply declare a, a unilateral ceasefire and the Oromo liberation army is not going to uh, fire a single bullet when the government had declared a ceasefire but they haven't in fact what the government had done is to intensify the military uh, juggernaut in western western Ethiopia, in the Wallega region. The OLA fighters um, did not want to fight the government as the peace process or peace talks was going on in uh, Dar es Salaam. But when the pressure increased, they, they, they fought back. And now the main uh, highway leading to western Ethiopia has uh, been basically effectively shut down to government, uh, government uh, uh, vehicles. Now, I understand when gov any, any government wants to put pressure uh, on the negotiators to uh, increase its own advantages in, in uh, engaging, uh, engaging with the rebel forces or insurgent forces. Uh, but this is not what, what was happening. The government simply increased the, uh, the war uh, for whatever reason, instead of showing goodwill and uh, determination to arrive at a, 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 a workable uh, agreement. Now, that said, I also mentioned at the beginning that there are the, the environment, even if these two sides are really working their hardest to bridge their differences, which are really uh, uh, wide, uh, quite wide apart, even if they are really engaged, the surrounding, the, 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 the environment is not... Uh, is not really favoring peace at this time because there are spoilers, there are uh, political uh, operatives who uh, who benefit from continued war, and there are also uh, war profiteers, uh, as I mentioned. Let me say one more thing about this. There is a whole lot of false and speculative reporting about uh, what's going on in Dar es Salaam. Um, for instance, that the government sent the head of the intelligence unit or the directorate in the military, not because his position warranted it, but because he is an Oromo uh, from Wallaga um, who can speak in a fan Oromo to, to the rebels. This is nonsense. Uh, but unit people are reporting on that. These are speculative uh, reporting and news uh, organizations should simply report on facts and what happened rather than on speculations as uh, as sinister as as this one this is simply to undermine to undermine the peace process so even outside forces are really trying to undermine it
by reporting on speculations or what, what it meant. To say that uh, one of the military negotiators uh, was sent here because he's from, he speaks of Anna Ramo and he's from Ulaga, is simply to diminish the process and the importance of it. But news media, uh, the news media is, is full of it. There is also false reporting that one of the military negotiators uh, left the Dar es Salaam because he was summoned to, to uh, Addis Ababa because he showed some closeness to the OLA. Look, OLA officials, military commanders, government officials, both sides negotiators, they are in the same hotel. They talk to each other. They sit down for coffee as they should. As they should. It's not always when they're sitting at the table that they should talk to each other. But to say and report as if this is true that uh, the deputy of the intelligence director of the, of the Ethiopian military, um, uh, um, the Ministry of Defense, uh, it's simply not true. The, the person left for health reasons, and he's not even in Addis, he's in, in, in Dubai from uh, the reporting that I have. So all of these combined, um, the difference between the two and the hostile forces who are not really in favor of an, a, a, peace re, a, a peace deal uh, are spoiling the environment uh, itself. So in general, uh, the... the the, the problem that the government is facing, the, the magnitude of the difficulty that it's facing, which should cajole all of them, should force all of them to try to find peace, at least in Oromia, uh, and then move on to another place. But I don't, I don't really see that kind of determination to, to move from the military solution to a political solution. Great, thank you, Skel. Uh, Taplai, uh, uh, early on, uh, Faisal was characterizing, uh, mentioning uh, how Abi uh, uh, claimed to uh, Red Sea, to Asab, and so on. And uh, this is at a time where, uh, like we were mentioning early on, uh, Eritrea's presence in Tigray, in Ethiopia, is still solid from Western Tigray to Northeastern. Uh, Tigray and Northern Tigray is solid entrenched, uh, I must say. So, uh, connecting the two, like the uh, even in the parliament, he gave a lot of explanation again about the claim to the Red Sea and so on. So, uh, one, you know, if you can focus as well on that, but also generally, what's your assessment of uh, his trip to Saudi Arabia and uh, his parliamentary uh, appearance on the November uh, November 13th. Well, in terms of um, Abiy's proposal for um, how to solve the, the Western Tigray issue, um, what he said in, in Parliament was that there is going to be a referendum to be held in, in Western Tigray. That that is his 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 solution. And although it's very difficult to, to trust Abiy, he said that the Amharam and Tigray um, authorities had agreed to that arrangement, to there being a referendum um, anytime soon. Now, I think it's very important to, to remind people of what has happened, what has happened in Western Tigray for the past three years. Even by the American government's admission, ethnic cleansing had happened in Western Tigray. Tigrayans had been ethnically cleansed out of Western Tigray. Uh, much more has happened, much more grotesque things have happened, but even, but let's settle for what the, the American government has admitted, um, ethnic cleansing. And now the security apparatus is run by Amhara officials who are extremely hostile to Tigrayans. They remain to be in charge, although the, the cover that Abiy provides in that federal security officials are going to be in charge, that is not going to happen. The Amharas will remain. And actually, the, the, the Amhara TV um, aired a program, I think, three days ago, where they interviewed people who are the administrators now in Western Tigray. And the people who are in charge of Western Tigray now say that they are not going to let go and that they are not going to let Tigrayans get back to their homes. So that is not happening. So all the lie that Abiy says by way of saying that Tigrayans are... Um, returning to their homes or that uh, displaced people will return or that normalcy will be resumed. That's all a lie. Um, and the idea that you will hold a referendum in a place where you have ethnically cleansed the, 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 the original residents is so beyond the pale. But that is what is being said in Parliament and that is what 
um, Abby's Western backers are um, um, accepting. And I find that extremely offensive as, as a notion, as an idea. The idea of holding a referendum in an area where the people, the original inhabitants have been ethnically um, cleansed out of the, of the, of the area. Um, I think serious people should take a, a tougher um, line. And actually, I should add, even the crisis group, um, the International Crisis Group, in the report they issued yesterday, they, they don't quite explicitly say it, but they seem to give some sort of credence to the um, suggestion that Abiyi is providing, that the, uh, that the federal government should remain in charge. Again, it, they, they don't quite explicitly say it, but reading between the lines, that is what they are implying. They say that if Abiyi was to return Western Tigray to Tigray, they say that that would anger um, Eritrea and that would mean uh, that there would be another um, conflict. That is what the crisis group um, says. When actually what they should say is that the way to return some sort of normalcy, some sort of peace in Ethiopia is for the prime minister, for Abiy to say that we are going to make constitutionality at the basis of everything that we do. We're going to rely, we're going to depend on the constitution. We're going to return Western Tigray to Tigray according to the constitution. And whoever has a claim is going to have to follow the constitution. That is going to be the foundation. That will be the surest way to, 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 um, to make sure that there is some sort of peace in, in Tigray. But that is not what the crisis group is advising um, Abiy. And we know that um, crisis group in Ethiopia, they have um, um, such a heft, um, not just in Tigray, but also among uh, diplomatic circles. It, it matters what crisis group says. And what they are saying in terms of Western Tigray is completely misguided. And it's not just now. Even... The past three years, uh, they have been giving credence to the idea that Western Tigray is a disputed um, territory. And part of the reason why uh, we are where we are in terms of Western Tigray is a uh, is, um, um, crisis group. Now, um, regarding Abiy, um, my, uh, regardless of Abiy's um, crusade um, against the, um, you could say, the, the Red Sea, my understanding is that he is not serious about launching. Um, war anytime soon. I, I don't think there is any concrete plan that that, that would happen. Um, I think it was something that he said in a, in a desperate attempt to divert from the extreme difficulty that he finds himself in, in Oromia and Amhara um, and in Tigray. The idea that Abiy would want another war when he's, when he's um, um, you know, bogged down in Oromia and in, in Amhara, I think that that would be so um, out of the window. I don't think that is the, the, the plan um, in terms of um, Abiy's Eritrean um, um, claims. Thank you. So like, uh, maybe when you come back, you'll talk about this. This was published on Trigahat about uh, the demographic uh, change in terms of... Uh, oh, yeah, I can go that's... through that. I, c I yeah, can go through okay. that, if yes. you allow me. Yeah. yeah, so essentially what has happened is um, a large number of people have... Um, have been settled in now um, since the grants have been hounded out from their from their areas, and they have settled in now, and they are pretending that um, they have been there forever, and that it was the Tigrans who were sort of um, uh, aliens in in Western Tigray. So that is the narrative that that they are being pushed. And as you could see in the in the numbers, it's a large number of people that they have settled in, and with the express purpose of holding a referendum, and they know that it's going to be a fate, a complete thing, because they have changed the demographic um, composition in such a way that if there was going to be a referendum tomorrow, the result can only be one thing. So it's going, the referendum, um, if it was going to be held tomorrow, will be a mere process for um, legalizing the annexation and nothing more. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, let's go to the last, uh, I mean, before your final thoughts, uh, I just want to pick your uh, brain in terms of uh, What's happening in the Middle East? Uh, there are people who say that actually he mentioned it in a way in, in the parliament as well, how that might affect what's happening in the Horn of Africa in general and in Ethiopia uh, in particular. So the international dimension, the isolation is there, but when you know leaders, regimes are isolated, we don't know what might happen uh, you know, after that and so on. So, what is your take, uh, Faisal, for example, in terms of what's happening in Israel, Palestine, um, and the whole Middle East uh, uh, dynamics, how that might affect or not uh, what's happening in Ethiopia, what uh, Abiy might do next? 
Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> I think it directly it may not uh, impact, uh, and I know that uh, Alex Diwal penned some ideas about this. Uh, you know, they this it, uh, Horn of Africa countries are always out there for sale and to get weapons. They have uh, little currency when it comes to international politics by lending their support to whichever side is giving them. So both Eritrea and Ethiopia, uh, for that matter, would be open for business. If Israel is squeezed and they need the Red Sea and they need Isaias, uh, he will weigh in terms of who's giving what. I think the very fact that Abiy is now very close to, the, to, the, um, to Dubai, which is unofficially for the Palestinian is, uh, but in, in the background, very much married to Israel at this point in time. Uh, I think Abi will be just uh, reading the tea leaves and go wherever Dubai, his friend, the only financier that he has now would go. In terms of, uh, I'd like to just say one quick comment in terms of the negotiations between between Ola and the Ethiopian federal government. I'm of the belief that, and I said this at another venue the other day, that they can only get success if they focus on small steps. The Oromo Liberation Army has an outstanding issue that's deeper than what can be resolved within a quick negotiation in Tanzania. And I'm looking at the Ola Oromo Liberation Front political program, which includes inter alia complete uh, freedom for the Oromia region. Whether that will always be in the background, the question is, can they come up with a quick, small step to just get over the hump so that they can silence the guns? But again, when even if they do silence the guns, the challenge for Ola is when they look at the political landscape of Ethiopia in terms of those groups that have signed agreements with the federal government of Ethiopia, whether that's the Ogaden National Liberation Front, the previous Oromo Liberation Front agreement with Abiy in 2018. The way they those agreements ended up really are very scary in the sense that they have been undermined. So I think that's in the background of Ola. The big issues, the language issues, the status of Addis Ababa, the Ola's relationship with the regional government of Oromia, those are very, very complex issues. And those are issues that they cannot really get, you know, quick uh, uh, over the hump. So I think that like they did in the Pretoria, my feeling is that the mediator is will try to twist the armies of both sides and bring them to agree on small items, such as silence it again, disarmament, reintegration of the Oromia, all our groups, uh, forces and what have you. And one or two, as uh, Scale said, reconstruction issues, and then suspend some of the big issues that the Oromo Liberation Front carried for a long time. That would be my read, but I think, uh, Abi is in a bind. I think uh, no matter which side he takes, whether it is the side of the Saudi Red Sea group, which is now excluding Ethiopia from having any say when it comes to the politics of the Red Sea, or he will stay with Dubai and then behind the scene with Israel, uh, which is, in my opinion, the most plausible uh, course that Abiy will follow because given Ethiopia's history, official history, that it has always been with uh, with with Israel, and the fact that the larger Arab group is not that friendly to 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 Prime Minister Abiy, except Dubai, which retains good relationship with Israel. If any window opens for him, it would be in the direction of uh, Israel. Great, thank you, Faisal. Uh, Scale, uh, any point to add on that? Uh, and uh, with that as well, your uh, final uh, thoughts on uh, everything you said today. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, on the issue of this ne negotiations, uh, I just wanted to add something to what Faisal just said and what's going, what's being reported in the news media. The idea that 
the political difference between or what separates, politically speaking, what separates the government from the Oromo Liberation Army is um, it's complicated, is not, is not something that I agree with because if they have goodwill, it's, it's simple. It's very simple, by the way, uh, in the sense that these are all constitutional questions in, in, Ethiopia, in Ethiopia that uh, uh, Oromia, Oromia must be uh, a self-governing unit within the federation. Uh, the political arena should be open. Uh, democratic com competition should be fair, free. These are not complicated issues. These are issues that all Ethiopians are asking for. Except that we should give that give in to uh, the prosperity parties' uh, uh, claim that uh, you you all have to you all have to compete in in, in, in elections uh, to to gain power. One of the things that the Ethiopian Prime Minister said, or the example that he cited for the peaceful political arena, is. Uh, the Oromo Federalist Congress said that the Oromo Federalist Congress, when speaking in parliament, that is, the Oromo Federalist, Con uh, uh, Federalist Congress is in the peaceful arena, conducting peaceful uh, uh, politics. Really, the, the Oromo Federalist Congress has lost three central committee members killed by the government, central committee members. The Oromo Federalist Congress had, around the elections, that fraudulent elections, had uh, had seen its leaders imprisoned, including the top leaders like the Kalagarba and Jawar Muhammad at the time, and uh, the Jane the Jane Tava. The Oromo Federalist Congress has no office operating in Ethiopia except the one that is in Addis Ababa. Uh, its leaders by the thousands are herded into prison, and some of them were uh, uh, hauled out of prison and were shot summarily. If that is, if that is peaceful uh, politics in Ethiopia, if the example of the Oromo Federalist Congress is the, 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 the model of peaceful politics in Ethiopia, then it's very difficult. It's very difficult to make, uh, to, uh, to reach an agreement, even for the Oromo Liberation Army. That's not the kind of model. Look, so it's not really complicated. What they are asking is not, it's not true, whatever is reported in the news media that they demanded a transitional government is not true. What they demanded was an arrangement, an arrangement that would get us maybe a, a, a transitional arrangement. And, and good uh, people of goodwill could make that arrangement because that is necessary. That's necessary. For Ethiopia's health and Ethiopia's future, that is necessary that Ethiopia re returns the, to the uh, path of democratization. So what they are asking is a roadmap that gets us to fair, free, and competitive election. It's not an immediate setup of the transitional government. It's a transitional arrangement. So if you give up on this one, on this idea, as if it is really a complicated issue, then what are you agreeing with? Aren't those the political issues that actually led to the conflict, not just in Oromia, but also in Tigray, that you cannot exercise in your region uh, uh, free, fair, and uh, that political participation should be open in, in all of these places? So it's really not complicated in that realm uh, as well. That Oromos must benefit from the benefits uh, economy, the demand for economic justice is not a difficult problem to resolve. Absolutely not a difficult problem to resolve. These are fair demands. It's good even for the government to make sure that the, the uh, benefits of growth uh, and the, and, and the uh, uh, resources of a region are actually fairly equitably distributed. That's not very difficult. To be able to speak your own language and develop your own identity without intervention from others telling you that you have to be more Ethiopian than being Oromo. That's not that's not that difficult issue. These are old issues, and they are not really an Oromo issues. These are all of us. The, all of us are demanding these issues, and they are constitutional. If the Ethiopian constitution is not the basis for agreement, 
for modest uh, 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 basis for a modest vivendi, what else could be? What else could be? So what they are asking is basically constitutional questions. They are not really asking for special treatment, including for the, for, for one thing, including the status of Addis Ababa. What the Oromo Liberation Front and the Oromo Liberation Army are asking actually is not even what is inscribed in the constitution. All they are asking is recognition. Let me repeat that. Recognition that Finfinne is within Oromia. Recognition. Otherwise, Addis Ababa will remain a self-governing unit. It's basically right. It's not even what is in the, the special uh, interest of Oromia. That's not even what the Oromo Liberation Army and Oromo Liberation Front are, are demanding. It's actually recognition. So there is really no complication here. They're asking for fair uh, 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 agreement, a fair agreement, like I said earlier, in which they are also part of the political process. Not today, but with a roadmap to reach, uh, to, to, to get into a national reconciliation or something like that. But if you don't have an agreement in principle, in principle, that the constitution would be respected, then there cannot be any agreement, then there will be no peace in, 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 uh, in Ethiopia. Let me emphasize, this is not really what the Oromo Liberation uh, uh, Army is asking. These are constitutional rights that everybody in Ethiopia is asking and pay the price for. So it's, it's really not complicated, to be honest. There is no incremental step that should be taken in this regard because this is what should have been done. These were rights that were given and rights, rights that were denied. So if these are not really uh, taken into account, then it will be a, a, a problem. And it will be a problem for the Ethiopian government in even its quest uh, to have uh, access to the sea. Uh, as long as you have a fighting in the back, uh, you cannot really go and uh, uh, find a, not that I agree with Asad uh, or the Red Sea, access to the Red Sea. I have spoken on this one on, on some, many occasions. This is not, in fact, there is no historical claim. There is no legal claim. There is no uh, economic claim. There is no justification for the Ethiopian uh, prime minister to raise this issue of Asad taking over a, a territory of another country. There is no economic issue, and I don't want to spend any time talking about, about that. But forever, for whatever they're doing to even preserve their power, they need to make peace. And making peace is based on the constitution. But as Takla was saying earlier, the issue of Western Tigray should be constitutionally settled. The one that they agreed to in front of the entire world to implement the constitution the Ethiopian government is not doing. While seeing this, that the Oromo Liberation Army is going to get into, <laughs> into uh, believing the government and then uh, expect uh, some kind of uh, goodwill on the part of the government. Well, if that is the case, you know, what, there's, what the government is putting on the table today was on the table uh, five years ago. That uh, they would, everybody silenced the, the gun and they move into the the peaceful political arena and conduct peaceful politics. That was the contract five years ago. That was abrogated by the Ethiopian government. And the people that took up arms against it is because the government betrayed, betrayed its own commitment. And since then, even since the Pretoria, the government has betrayed. So that is the, 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 the problem. Look, it's not only for uh, OLA. This is as long as the underlying issues as political issues as have not been resolved, there cannot be a, a ceasefire or a, a peace in, in, in that area. Thank you, uh, Skel, for that. Uh, Tahlai, uh, final thoughts? Well, I would like to um, start by saying a few words about the general condition in, in, in Tigray. Um, like I said in my um, opening remarks, because the, the guns have been silenced and because the condition undeniably is better than it was um, last year, for instance, uh, people have misconstrued that to mean that everything is now all of a sudden all right in Tigray. But if you speak to people in, in Tigray, the first thing that you understand is nothing is all right. People are suffering. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the people actually in relatively normal life, not the people in IDP centers, but the people in, in, in no, who have normal lives now, who are in Matale, 
um, really, really suffering because the things that they see on a daily basis are extremely uh, difficult to, to cope with. And I think there is a deliberate um, negligence or we could use um, a deliberate um, attempt to ignore what is happening on the part of the international community. And the absence of the absence of war in Tigray shouldn't be misconstrued to mean that there is peace in, in, in Tigray. And the Western Tigray situation is extremely um, volatile if it, if it doesn't get resolved um, soon. Um, you, you can't have people in, in IDP centers, in extremely difficult IDP centers for, um, for years and years and years. People are waiting desperately. They don't have anything to, to eat. And the, the, the idea that um, Western countries like the American government, the European Union, is buying into Abiy's solution of holding a referendum when people are in this um, condition is so beyond the pale that anybody who is in this business should be ashamed of, of themselves. Um, and I would like to make a general point. Um, one thing that stood out for me when Abiy was um, speaking at the parliament was how how dangerous his, his, his demeanor was generally. He was, he, we could see that he's very, very desperate. He was flailing around. And I don't want to psychoanalyze Abiy, but you know, a person in this state of mind could do anything. And Gitacho, I told you that I don't think there, there's going to be war between Eritrea and Ethiopia, but a leader who is in this state of mind, who is so desperate, who is running out of options, and who seems to have woken up to the fact that people know he's not good enough, anything could happen. And he could do, he could declare anything. And I think people who have some sort of leverage on, on Abiy, the American government and other um, Western powers, should try to restrain him because otherwise it could be extremely dangerous for Ethiopia and for the for the for the Horn of Africa. And um, what is the way out? One solution that the um, crisis group report um, suggests is that Abiy should try to speak to representatives from the Amhara um, region, from Fano, to representatives from Oromia, and to representatives from Tigray. And one of the assumptions they have made to say that is that Abiy is a good faith actor. He is someone who is trying his best to, to, to resolve conflicts. But that is a problem. Abiy is not a good faith um, actor in all this. Um, he's playing gimmicks around in, in, in Amhara, in Tigray, in Oromia, and in, in Somalia, and in all other places. And I think that's a very, very basic assumption that they should understand. That by they, I mean the people who are trying to have leverage on Ethiopia from, 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 from outside. Um, because the way things are going, they're just saying, um, what is that? rearranging the, the decks in the Titanic when, you know, when everything is too late, when nothing matters, when everything is a foregone conclusion. That is the state that Abiy is in. Nothing that he's going to do now is going to matter in terms of bringing about a positive solution. He has run out of options. People who have um, some sort of leverage on Abiy should really understand this and try to restrain him and try to um, start planning what the exit for Ethiopia um, should be. Because what I see is a very, very um, dangerous man who could uh, plunge the country into, into the abyss. Thank you. Uh, Faisal, uh, the final, final thought is yours today. Yeah, I think we shouldn't even argue or, you know, I mean, Abiy has proven that he's a very dangerous leader. He will always say that it's not, that danger is not coming from him, it's coming from the people of Ethiopia and political elite. But anybody who is analyzing Ethiopia's condition for one prime minister in five years to preside over four or five conflicts in which he was active, just gives you that the danger is there. The other danger is that for a prime minister to talk about taking over, whether he is ready for war or not, but the diplomatic uh, uh, downgrade the, and language that he's using vis-a-vis -vis neighboring countries and the unsettling that he's causing other countries to watch out. Because most some wars don't happen because you, you planned. They happen because a trigger-happy soldier who is on a standby shoots the first gun. And Abiy created that condition from Somalia, from Kenya, from Eritrea and Djibouti. So the danger is there. The country is really, I mean, uh, there is less and less positive to, to point at. 
as you are showing, I always told you it was 34% inflation, but now you are saying 40 plus percent inflation, $3 billion need to just service its own debt, which I understand that China finally suspended the payment of $2 billion to service its state, which is a little bit good information, but it's just postponing the pain that Ethiopia's bill is literally trash at this point in time. People cannot afford the food, it's stable food in the cities that they cannot, as Scale was saying, even people like Marara Gudina, who is a chairman of a viable political party, cannot attend a funeral in Ambo, which is the next door to Addis Ababa. The country is hanging on a thin, thin, thin uh, thread to explore any day. So I think it's to the benefit of Abiy to do several things. Number one, to abide by the Pretoria Agreement. And as Taklai said, as Abiy already signed and his uh, representative signed that uh, Western Tikrai would be uh, addressed per constitution. That's what has been signed. I don't think he should renege on that. That's number one. I think in number two, if he wants to really silence the guns in Oromia and then move to the roadmap that uh, my colleague talked about, then he needs to show good faith uh, negotiation and agree on several key points that Ola is uh, demanding, including the silencing of the gun and accepting the roadmap, if that roadmap is mutually beneficial. I think he needs to seriously talk with the Amara groups and also silence the gun there. The only challenge that with the Amara group, I would say that uh, international crisis group also pointed out is it will take time A, to identify the leadership, B, to coalesce a group of representatives who can speak authoritatively on representing the Amara group, and then C, at this point in time, I'm not really clear, except the general dissatisfaction that the Amara uh, movements do have. What is the central point of the Amara leader is an argument that they can bring to the table. Maybe one is to change the federal structure, to revisit the federal constitution and some issues that are out there. So I think it's a very challenging situation. This would be a meticulous, slow process that people need to really sit back and focus on the small steps before they jump into the big, big, big steps that can finish everything. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Faisal. for a very insightful evening uh, today. And I uh, hope uh, again to see you uh, in the next episode of the H panel. Good night and good morning, Talai. Bye. Good morning. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Goodbye. You have been following us live uh, on H panel and on satellite under HPS or Horn Broadcasting Services in the Horn of Africa. And we'll uh, again meet uh, in another episode of the H panel uh, next week, Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Good night from here. Bye.